there's a busy agenda ahead. So uh, officially, welcome to everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Madison. I'm a professor of law at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law, and this is the virtual seminar series on the future of law in technology and governance, a co-sponsored production of the Center for Governance and Markets at the University of Pittsburgh and the Future Law Project, which is my effort to explore the future of all things in our fragile world at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. Thanks to the center for its ongoing support of this project. It is most appreciated. I'm gonna give a very, very brief introduction of our guests today. I am delighted primarily to start with, welcome my friend, Jessica Silby, who is a fantastic legal scholar at Boston University. I reached out to Jessica a while back and invited her to find something that she could share with us as part of this series. Jessica asked me if she could bring an experimental project and two awesome colleagues with her to share with us. Uh, so I said, of course, that would be fantastic. So in a moment, I'm gonna turn it over to Jessica and her colleagues. They will introduce themselves and their project I will caution everybody in advance, this is not a stereotypical academic seminar in the sense that there's a talk followed by questions. Uh, the entirety of the, uh, entirety of the hour is going to be turned over to the team of three. Um, so we're, it's a participatory uh, activity, I am told. And so I will stop talking and welcome Jessica Halsey and Newman. Great, thanks. I'm actually just going to turn it over to Newman because uh, she's going to start us going. But I will say for the folks in the Zoom room that we are going to be asking for your um, participation um, in terms of reactions and reading some things and then talking to us about it. So um, we do hope the hour will go by quickly. Thanks, Jessica. And thanks, everybody, for being here. I'm really excited to share this work with you. And thanks for having us. Halsey is going to tee up some slides. We're going to, today we're going to be sharing with you a project called Artificial Justice. And as the slides are coming up, I wanted to remind everybody that when you have split screen so that we can still see each other, there's a vertical line. Um, when you're looking at a, are you having trouble sharing Halsey? Yeah, just give me one second. It works yeah, no problem. Before, of course. Yeah, but if you, okay. I can do it as a backup if necessary. Um, but anyway, when the slides come back up, there's a vertical line in the Zoom and you can actually drag it back and forth. So sometimes it like makes every, all the heads small and all the slides really big. But in the interest of seeing each other, you might wanna make our slides small and make us big. And then when it's um, time to read text on slides, you might do that again. So let's try this again. Perfect. So this project is called Artificial Justice um, and it's an inquiry into language models in the law. And if you've, um, looked at any piece of news <laughs> um, or any social media in the past day, but let alone like six months, you've probably seen mention of language models and what, what's happening um, with these, these large language models. And that's what this project is about, how that interacts and interfaces with the law. But to get things started and to just get a sense of you all and where you're all coming from, we wanted to do a quick poll. Um, so the way we're going to we're going to ask you to answer is in the chat, since some people understandably are off camera today. Um, but before you push send, we invite everybody to just type your answer into the chat, but don't hit enter yet, because we don't want to influence each other. So my response to recent AI developments has been overall optimistic, concerned, confused, unmoved. And since this is actually a not a multiple choice, you're welcome to choose another word um, if, if one of these words doesn't speak to you. But everybody take a moment to, um, to answer in the chat. This is just to get a brief sense of kind of where people are feeling in the room. And then on the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to press enter. All right, don't let Peter's answer. Um, okay, here they come. All right, everybody press, press enter. All right, let's go. Ooh, okay, we have alarmed, optimistic, concerned, unmoved, optimistic, optimistic, concerned, but optimistic, optimistic dash concerned. That was me. Okay, nice. We've got a good variety here. Alarmed. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Great. All right. Well, let's just see where the room is. It's useful to feel feel the emotions. All right. Next slide, please. So there's some big questions that we're thinking about with this project. We're going to share a few with you before we introduce ourselves. One is how would we feel if an AI system appeared to reason? What would we accept its decisions 
in a legal in our legal or social systems. We're also considering is our current justice system as biased and arbitrary as an AI based system? I think that's a very interesting question. <laughs> And with that, we're gonna just introduce ourselves and our work and then we're gonna share more about the project. Yeah, so very briefly, hi everyone. Um, my name is Jessica and I teach law at Boston University School of Law. I am primarily a constitutional law and intellectual property professor. Um, and these are some of the books that I've written or co-authored or co-edited. Um, I have a background in literature and film as well as in law. My PhD is in comparative literature, so I often bring a, a hum humanistic, humanities-based methods approach to my study of intellectual property and con law. Oops. All right. Thanks, Jessica. Um, my name is Halsey Burgund. I am uh, not a lawyer. I'm an artist, a creative technologist. I use a lot of different types of technologies, very old ones like language, very new ones like artificial intelligence. I like to do a lot of co-creation with participants in, in my work. Um, I am currently a uh, creative technologist in residence at the MIT Open Documentary Lab and also um, am a part of MetaLab where Newman is as well as a, a research affiliate um, at Harvard. Um, I just going to take you through real quick of some basic projects that I do a lot. I do a lot of geolocated audio work. So here's sort of a map of overlaying audio on a landscape. I also use um, mobile apps for, um, you know, producing work that can be uh, experienced um, in in the real world in different locations as you wander around. Um, I like to do a lot of pro-social work whenever I can. This particular project is done at the uh, at one of the Japanese uh, internment camps. Um, trying to repatriate some of the uh, experiences that uh, the folks who lived there had during that tragic situation. Um, and I have also dived into artificial intelligence quite a bit. Um, obviously this project and um, one of my first projects doing, doing working with artificial intelligence used um, synthetic media, deep fakes, and uh, it was called In Event of Moon Disaster. And um, I am super interested in, in all of these technologies and how they can be aesthetically and pro-socially used. And I will hand off to Newman. Thanks, Halsey. For those of you who haven't seen the last project that Halsey mentioned in the event of moon disaster, it, it was actually, uh, I believe, a Emmy Award win. Was it Academy or Emmy? It, it was Emmy. It was Emmy. Emmy, Emmy nominated. Not, not Emmy, Emmy nominated documentary. Um, it's fantastic. It's Richard Nixon. Um, giving the speech that was written if the Apollo 11 mission had failed as a deep fake. It's a, it's a really profound and moving provocation. Um, I would highly recommend it. I'm Newman. I, you met me already a little bit. My full name is Sarah Newman, but my nickname is Newman. So you can call me Newman. And I, I as already was mentioned, I'm the director of art and education at MetaLab, which is a project of the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard. My background is in philosophy and fine art but I do AI research. So I'm bringing the sort of, like Jessica, humanistic perspective to AI and also co-founded something called the Data Nutrition Project where I'm the research lead. And we we basically work on data, data set transparency. A um, couple of my projects to give you a sense of my aesthetic. Um, this is a recent installation I did at the Spencer Museum of Art at the University of Kansas, which was working with formerly incarcerated women who are now out to surface the wisdom that they have and share their voices with a broader audience. Um, as the people on this call know, most of you probably, like most, most of the um, folks that have been previously incarcerated are not really seen as uh, teachers in society, but they have a lot of wisdom. Um, this is a, a walking labyrinth where the entire labyrinth was made of philosophical questions that relate to our, um, basically how we, how we, that are inspired by how we relate to technology. Um, specifically thinking about value alignment in a time of artificial intelligence. And here is a little bit of a preview of the nutrition label I mentioned, what, encouraging more transparency into data sets. So I do everything from like more technical AI research to more creative stuff to more poetic stuff. So it's a real combination. And with that, I'm back over to Halsey to tell you a little bit more about this project. Alrighty, so we thought that a good way to introduce the project was to sort of go through the the, the timeline of this project. This project is really much more uh, about the process. It's about, um, you know, this big iteration thing in the middle is really where um, a ton of our focus has been. We've had some amazing 
calls amongst ourselves, amongst the team, and um, you know, trying to sort of flesh things out in a dynamic environment, as was mentioned earlier, uh, that we all live in with these new AI developments happening all the time. So we started this, the sort of concept way back in, in, in 2020, seems so long ago now. And then we've been sort of iterating through this ideation and implementation loop, trying technical things, learning about the technical stuff and, um, and iterating. Uh, and now we're sort of, we're continuing this iteration, but we're also looking to uh, share and become more sort of public with stuff and get feedback and inputs from folks like you guys. So again, the concept as it started was, you know, sort of similar to some of the questions we posed at the beginning, but what would it mean if for society, if at the highest level decisions were made by AI systems instead of by human beings? And, um, you know, can art, an art project, expose how AI is already used to, uh, to manipulate and control many of our everyday experiences. This is a, a big concern of all of, of all of ours on the team, and and we wanted to sort of dive in a, in a perhaps um, perhaps not totally direct and perhaps slightly different different way. So as far as ideation and development goes, you you get that we're an interdisciplinary team. Obviously, the legal expertise is critical, and some of the artistic and AI experiences that we've had are really important too. We've done a lot of research into the tools as they exist. They obviously change um, a lot, uh, you know, constantly, but we've tried to sort of stay on top of that. Um, and basically, you know, we tried to create this scenario that we're referring to, which is how can we get one of these large language models to, you know, make these decisions or emulate, I should say, one of these decisions. Clearly, we've thought a lot about these concepts, justice, you know, what is justice? How do language, justice, law, and technology intersect? These are things we'll hopefully get into in a discussion with you all. And um, I just want to have a shout out to the Notre Dame um, Tech and Ethics Lab for providing us with some funding to really make this work. We're very, very indebted to them and appreciate it. So I'm going to hand back to Newman for talking about the iterative stuff, and uh, we'll keep it going. Thanks, Halsey. And we're gonna be opening this up for some discussion really soon, because I know we promised that at the beginning, but we wanted to take you through the contours of how we got to where we are right now. And the iteration is a big part of that. Um, first, we noticed that um, the outputs were bad and inconsistent, but as we've said, the large language models and their technology have changed dramatically over, I mean, even like daily <laughs> things are changing, but certainly over the past 18 months, things have changed a lot. So it's been an exciting and sometimes frustrating space to be working in because of how quickly the technology is changing. Um, but that also led to this insight, like what we were bringing on as a provocation, what we were introducing as a provocation was be is becoming a reality. So our approach to it as artists and thinkers and scholars had to change. Because if it's only a provocation, then there's different there's different risks um, with communicating it in the way that we were communicating it than if it's if it's a reality. And so we really want to take that to heart. Um, and we decided to shift our focus towards the implications and reactions from people rather than technical capabilities because there's no way that like three people can compete with these technical companies in terms of trying to train or build a model, but rather we have touch points and expertise. Um, with how people are reacting. Uh, next slide, please. And so speaking to that, we're really interested in how people with and without legal expertise react to this idea. These, these technologies are becoming more and more real and more and more integrated with our lives. So what, how do we feel about them? And we're using these workshops of various sorts with different groups to share discoveries and sort of gather gather reflections from, from the audiences. Um, and we want the project to encourage sort of for more research on this topic and also uh, sort of more public engagement with the ways these tools that could and should be used and should not be used. Um, anyway, there's, there's more to see on this slide, but with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jessica to um, take you through some of the actual content. Okay, um, right, so I'm up. So what we're gonna do um, is uh, just so, if, I know that not everyone, not, in, in fact, I hope fewer of you are lawyers or um, law professors, I hope you're not. Um, but uh, um, we are gonna, we, we generated um, outputs from our large language model after it was fine tuned on Supreme Court opinions. So we used chat GPT-3 and then fed it with um, Supreme Court cases or summary summaries of those cases that the Supreme Court provided. Um, 
And then we asked it questions uh, that have don't have eight legal answers yet. Um, so it couldn't have been pulling from a database to find an accurate result. It had to actually produce a decision answering a question that has not yet been answered by, um, by the Supreme Court. And then we evaluated them. We were looking at them and we produced so many, we, you know, we, we produced lots and lots of them. And what we're going to ask you to do is look at some of them. I'm going to, they're short, they're three paragraphs. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to show you two. Um, uh, and uh, alongside the outputs, um, I also had uh, legal professionals, me included, try to write an answer to the question that didn't yet have an answer. So what would I, as a lawyer, how would I ad suggest the answer should be? What would, a, what would a legal professional say the answer is? And so we also have outputs that are written by humans. Um, and I, we're gonna ask you, um, so we're gonna, we're gonna put two of these in front of you. You don't know if they're written by humans or uh, uh, an, uh, an AI uh, bot. Um, and we're going to ask you some questions about them. I'm going to read them to you. Um, and if you don't want to hear me read it and you prefer to um, read it yourself, if it's, you know, distracting to have somebody read to you, um, please just, you know, um, mute me um, on your side. And then um, we're going to move the slide. So I'm going to show you a slide of a decision. Um, and then after I read it through, we're gonna change the slide and we're gonna have questions about that decision for us to talk about. Uh, but the decision will also be alongside it. So you'll be able to reference, you don't have to remember everything. Okay. All right, here we go. Two, we're just gonna do two of them. All right. So the question presented is, does the constitution, the US constitution permit an automated robot powered by AI to be a copyright author? So this is the decision from the court. A majority held that the US Constitution does not permit an automated robot powered by AI to be a copyright author. The court begins its analysis by emphasizing the copyright clause in the US Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, which grants Congress the power to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing the limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. The court notes that the framers intent was to incentivize human creativity and innovation by providing exclusive rights to authors. The court then examined the Copyright Act, which has consistently been interpreted by the Copyright Office to require human authorship for copyright protection. Court recognizes the act does not explicitly define author, but acknowledges the historical understanding that copyright protection is granted to human created works. Extending copyright protection to works created by AI would be inconsistent with the purpose of the copyright clause and the history of copyright law in the United States. The court also expressed concerns that the granting AI generated works copyright protection could potentially stifle human creativity and innovation, which would be contrary to the purpose of copyright law. The court concluded that based on the constitution and the existing copyright law, AI generated works are not eligible for copyright protection. There was an, a dissenting opinion that argues that the constitution's copyright clause should be interpreted more broadly to encompass AI generated works as the framers could not have anticipated the development of AI. The dissent contends that granting copyright protection to AI generated works could still promote the progress of science and useful arts by incentivizing investment in AI technologies. So that's a decision capsule for you. And here are some questions. So thinking about what the result of this case is and how it's reasoned, does this decision align with your idea of what is right or what is just? That is, if do you think it's right that a copyright author um, only be human? Um, what, if anything, is missing from this decision for you that would make it a better decision from the perspective of justice, from your idea of what is what is right and true for the law? Would it matter to you if the court opinion were written or issued by an AI system? Does it, would it matter to you whether this decision, this question, was answered by an AI robot or um, a person? Why or why not? And then finally, do you think this was produced by a large language model or by a human and why? So we would love any and all thoughts on any of these four questions. Please raise your hand if you have thoughts. 
Yes, Michael. So uh, this does not read to me like a human created text. This reads to me like a robot. Okay, how come? Uh, it's a very kind of a legally technical uh, reaction, uh, but I focus on what I'd call like the both sort of the combination of the aesthetics and the syntax of how the citation to the Constitution appears in the second line of the second paragraph. Aesthetic and syntax. Um, when you say aesthetic, what do you mean by that? Doesn't look like something that a human lawyer would write or a human judge would write. I see. So there's like a genre question going on. Is that what you yes. mean? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Peter. Um, I myself have problems ethically with the creation of a slave mind by humans. And so I- I'm gonna remind you, so this was a case about plural marriage. The question is whether the constitution forbids a state from legalizing plural marriage. And I'll just, I, I'll just read it again. Okay, the majority of the Supreme Court held that constitution does not prohibit a state from allowing plural marriage. Any constitutional restrictions on a state's regulation of marriage are found in the 14th Amendment's due process and equal protection clauses. Should a state under its police powers wish to extend the definition of marriage to between more than two people, its law must merely be supported by a legitimate state purpose. Without question, civil marriage enhances the welfare of the community. It's a social institution of the highest importance, even as the history of marriage has been one of both continuity and change. Whether a traditional two-partner marriage or a plural marriage is a more optimal setting for the children for children is traditionally a decision for the state, not for a federal court. Three justices dissented, arguing that the state lacked a rational basis for the law and could perceive no basis on which to justify the dramatic change to the institution of marriage as historically understood for millennia. To the contrary, the record demonstrates an animosity to traditional marriage, raising a specter of religious discrimination that could potentially render the law constitutionally infirm. Remand for further inquiry under the First Amendment is therefore necessary. Okay, so the same questions apply here, we want to know whether you feel differently. Um, does this decision align with your idea of what is right and just? Um, that is both its reasoning and its result. Um, what if anything is missing from this decision that would make it more just to you? Would it matter to you if this decision, court, court opinions or this decision were written and issued by an AI system? Why or why not? Do you think that this was produced by a large language model or by a human and why? Well, while folks are thinking of that, maybe we can kick things off with Dr. Thomas's um, comment in the chat. Um, in terms of deconstructing the reasoning process of robots, AI generated poems might be more illuminating and less threatening than AI generated legal summaries. So that was Jessica in response to your last question yeah. and maybe we can start there. Thank you for bringing that over. Um, Anjali, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and there's another question, um, who actually reaps the benefits or the punishments? Surely it wasn't the monkey and surely it won't be the AI. That is to say whose bank account will be impacted, right? So this goes to the question of what is law, which is one of the things that we've been thinking a lot about is, is there something different about our legal system and the way decisions are made and um, particularly that they should be written and explained um, that make language modeling like this um, either more problematic or less problematic um, uh, for a justice system? Poems don't determine human futures, law does. Is that what, is that what Newman just said? Is that your view, Newman? What? I've yeah. always thought art changes the world. <laughs> okay, uh, Maybe Mike. Not liter literally. <laughs> I, mean, I thought it was like, I thought the quote was like, one great rock concert can change the world. Cite Jack Black and School of Block. Anyway, um, uh, so I think your question about it, like what makes law law is lurking, um, right? And yeah, and yeah. It, so I mean, there's lots of I mean, there's like massive literature about that, obviously, and we don't need to rehash all of that. But it 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 for purposes of your hypo here, it you do we? So the, my response to the first one was purely on the surface of the text that you showed us and that you read, right? Um, right. So there's one sense in which law is 
law because it is sort of formalistically presented, as you said, in a certain genre or genres. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also a, a there's a, a adjacent set of expectations about institutional production. That is to say, law comes from systems and institutions that are constructed in certain ways that are expected to behave in certain ways and whatever those systems generate is counted as law. And then there is a second set, adjacent set of considerations, which is to look at the look at the content of what's been produced, not necessarily at the semantics of it, and say that from a content standpoint, it accords with whatever personal or cultural or social intuitions about what is right and just, right? Um, but so these are not completely independent ways of looking at the world, but they are overlapping and somewhat independent ways of looking at the world, right? And I haven't I haven't exhausted, I've just gone through yeah, three right. kind of obvious things. Um, right, so, so to me, the problem with this uh, is that it doesn't have all of the semantic markers on the surface that allow me to code it as likely automated or likely not the way I reacted to the first one. Because there's no citations to other authorities, which is kind of a, 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 you know, kind of a signal that this is being published in a way that is part of an ecosystem of related texts. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we can have a conversation about the substantive justice of the outcome, uh, which I'm, you know, sim- obviously I'm very sympathetic to. Many people are very sympathetic to. We have no way to evaluate the input side, right? There's no way to decide based on the text what we might know about robots or uh, traditional legal institutions as the kind of originators of this. Yeah. Um, so does the the lack of citations um, matter to you? in whether i mean is that I, i'm i'm that's just a that's that was just a signal in the past and you, and you don't have that here that's what you're saying so it it it's not determinative yeah. but it's an it's an indicator right so i had this conversation i had this conversation with my students yesterday in so i'm teaching copyright law and i give my students these hypos that say you know produce a report for clients about the state and as it happens the current assignment is produce a report for for their clients about the the state of of LLMs, large language models, as pertains to copyright, go. Uh, And the students said, well, what should I do? And I said, well, you have clients as your audience. And the students say, well, do I need to cite cases and statutes? And I say, well, think about it from the standpoint of your client. Your client wants to know that what you're saying is authoritative, Yeah. right? But they're not and they're not likely to simply take your word for it until they've built some kind of trusting relationship with you. So you don't want to over drench your work with legal citations because that is distracting from the point of the advice. But you want to have enough cited legal authorities right. in your work to signal to the client that your advice is grounded in something other than just your right. seat of the so, pants. So what this makes me think of is something that's in the chat also is that um, what gives laws authority is that it is derived from humans, yes. that it's a conversation between humans. And the citation, the citation is, um, the citation practice in law is about deference to other decision makers um, whose decisions are supposed to be trusted as well. I love this idea that law is a conversation between persons, not a conversation between robots and humans. Yes, idea that that's why humans accept law. um, And so, yeah, so uh, figuring out whether um, law would be unacceptable if derived from algorithmic decisions, I think is part of what um, we're trying to figure out because it's already well embedded, algorithmic processes are already well embedded in our legal system um, already. Um, Sorry, I just wanted to add something real quick there. It's, you know, the law, I mean, these, these models, specifically, you know, our model, we fine tuned it on, you know, human written information, and they're entirely trained on human written information. Um, And, you know, in some sense, the large language model is perhaps just paraphrasing or putting together, you know, something that generated in a human, you know, you know, from a human being to start with. And I'm not making this argument, but, you know, if it, if, if the requirement is for it to be sort of, you know, coming forth from humans, one could, I suppose, make the argument that uh, because the training data for this model is all human generated stuff, at least it is thus far, pretty soon our new models are going to have training data that was, you know, from an LLM also, which is another problem, but assuming it's all uh, human, you know, generated, 
you know, what, what is the implication there? What does, does that, yeah. you know, um, just a question. Right. So, and, and also our legal system is so screwed up, you know, um, it, the, the question also that Halsey, the third question that we asked at the beginning is the AI system, the comparable advantage of an AI decision, as opposed to what we have now, I think is something we want to consider. I'm very intrigued by Allison's comment about the, it mattered by, um, it turns out the whole time it mattered by what process the written, written product was produced. The troubles that the product is not inherently reflected by the product. Ask your, so this is, a, this is uh, Allison, I'd love you to say more about this. To me, this sounds like you're making a due pro, what we would call in law a due process argument, a question about transparency, trusting the process, but you should tell me what, or us what you're thinking. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I guess I can probably, I mean, I can I volunteer to serve as the local archivist in this in this process, although that's not quite um, uh, fair. Um, I play one on TV. Um, I, I mean, this is, I'm in the process of having to to talk on this myself, um, not directly, obviously, with the law, but on, on the role of um, AIs in the production of uh, creative art objects, right? Um, I have my art history hat on here. And um, the... I just keep coming back to the fact that it is a delight to see the works of art that Dolly and Midjourney produce. Like you type in words and it's like a magic, it's like a, literally a magic spell. I type in words and the picture appears and it has that same sort of delightful response. But the fact of the matter is, um, oftentimes that's where it ends. And it's it's in part because one doesn't connect with these objects. The wh When you know it's AI generated, you don't connect with these objects. So then that begs the question of why. And so here I am uh, thinking about process. It's because I use my empathy to connect with these art objects. And I'm, again, I, I'm, I'm using my own area, not the law, because um, uh, that isn't my no, analogies are very helpful. <clears throat> I use my own empathy to connect with these art objects. I imagine what it's like to be a human producing these. I live in this embodied world with this other human that produced this thing. Um, and I use that as I connect to this extrinsic um, product. So I say ask your local archivist, because even in the realm of, of human produced um, uh, documents that, uh, you know, somebody's filing cabinet that you that arrives on the loading dock and you need to process it um, as an archives, the whole issue is that um, those 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 remnants, that evidence that that human left in their filing cabinet has has a, a form of procedural context that doesn't stay with the evidence. And frankly, the way I teach it anyway in class or taught it is that archivist's job is actually to sort of like grab all the process context that they can and try to maintain it in text form around these documents so that they can be well contextualized within even only the human experience. So as we add AI work in here, and Halsey, I was hearing what you were saying about the, the LLMs, that's just synthetic text, right? Um, uh, it, which, I mean, and I say just, meaning it doesn't come from um, an active and ongoing and um, inter-responsible relationship with the embedding world. It's just a uh, rules-based uh, text production that all this time, all that process, all that connection, all that engagement with the world mattered. And we could just assume it was human. We could just assume it was ours. And as that breaks down, um, we're still stuck in a situation where the evidence doesn't contain the process. Um, and that's going to be, um, I, I don't want to say a problem, uh, but I want to say maybe it's just a realization we have as a group. Right. So um, so there, there are different ways. I, I'm, what I'm hearing from you, Anjali, you're next, is that um, the, the problem could be an ethical problem. It could be an epistemological problem. It could be a problem of um, violence, of the kinds of like human violence, like part of Part of I think when we're we're asking this in the context of law because law is the state is is um, is the justification of the state's use of force against all things people persons and animals and property etc. Um, and and so the the I think the the context in our in our in knowledge production and our I don't I'm not an archivist is is a different set of questions, although it's very helpful to have this similar, you know, the, the process question, I think, raised. Um, 
but they are overlapping, obviously, the whole idea of an archive, what we're dealing now with is is the endless archive as well. All right, I'm right. rambling. Uh, Anjali. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. No, 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 sorry. Allison, did you want to say something more? I just, I want to, I want to make, I want to try to make the connection stronger because I agree it's, it's not coterminous, these ideas, but the, the, the issue at hand to me is that from what I understand of the legal, the ongoing millennium long legal conversation is that there could be a, an assumption that the person producing the text has a similar relationship, not the same, actually sometimes it just assumed to be the white male relationship to the embedding world, right? But we don't live in a world where that assumption is possible. And so it was always there. That connection was always there. It was just assumed. And now it can't be assumed. And we yeah. have to make decisions about it. Got That's it. the connection. That's fabulous. That's fabulous. Anjali. Yeah, so I think I'm just trying to tease out in light of those comments that Allison made, some of what I'm thinking through, which is process related as well. So I wanted to think a little bit about process and also this bank account question that was raised yeah. earlier. One of the things that's implicit to me in human written opinions is that the process isn't flat, right? And we maybe we've been talking around this a little bit, but we don't give, when we write opinions, right, depending on the person writing the opinion, we don't give necessarily weight the same way to the the people down the line right so there is an implicit weighting of precedent that happens i mean this is of course if you believe in the idea that law is objective and you know um that we're just producing opinions like an opinion machine then i, I can't help or persuade in that context but i'm saying generally speaking what ends up happening i think is there is an authorship um process that involves an implicit weighting of certain arguments versus others, right? Which is our entire problem with the Supreme Court right now, yeah. that there is an overweighting of certain opinions and an underweighting of others. And so it's interesting to me in the justice question that you're asking is um, the possibility of, I guess, two broad options. The first option being a sort of flattening of that. So yeah. you could produce an AI um, or LLM model that just treats all of those opinions as equal, right? And those opinions we know aren't representative anyway of like the entirety of possible opinions uh, or outcomes in that case. But yeah. at least, you know, you have more of a sort of political spectrum there, or you could build an AI system and I think this is part of what Allison was getting at that's reflective of a certain political perspective, right? And so it seems to me that that is part of um, what's happening uh, mm -hmm. here. And then I wonder about that second question, the money question is underlying a bunch of this, right? We talk about justice, but are, is what we're really talking about um, partially a capitalism question and you know personally yeah. i think when we're talking about justice we're always talking about capitalism and how and where money flows even when we're talking about plural marriage so yeah. i guess that's what i'm thinking yeah yeah i love you that know. i love that there's um I think there's a there's a sense in which we in asking this question where we really are probing people's idea of what counts as justice. So, you know, whether it could be forms of transparency, whether it could be a particular kind of process, whether it could be including all stakeholders, like being more um, thinking more about distributive justice. Um, now, when um, Dr. Thomas says uh, it could be easier for some systems, right, to conceptualize justice in terms of some, I would say, quantifiable ideas or the assumption of certain things that are quantifiable than other ideas like fairness, altruism, and empathy. So, you know, in previous workshops, some of our um, our participants did have a preference that AI systems would choose what would might be more um, work would produce opinions and hand down issue opinions um, for uh, for AI for. AI machines, for example, that there would be some sort of um, parity that if the decision was about robots and about due process regarding robots, it would be fine for an AI decision. And we thought that was interesting. They did have uh, categories that they did not worry if the AI was making the decision and other categories that they did. And this decision, the plural marriage one, they did not want AI judges making this decision, for example. So that sort of um, reflects a little bit what um what is being said here do you want to regenerate the response oh um right so did you try to reach it yes so one of the i did want to say to anjali's point um when we ask the question of the N nlp um we get different responses every time um so one of the things that this workshop is a little bit about is we we just selected one of them 
Um, but we can show you, and we're probably running out of time, but we have um, inconsistent answers from the NLP on almost all of the questions. So I wrote, I should say, I wrote this one. This is what I, one of the decisions that I wrote, um, trying to sound like the synopses in front of the Supreme Court opinions um, that we often read as lawyers. Um, and, uh, um, but when you ask the NLP this question, you get, you can get yes, no, lots of dissents, sometimes completely inconsistent and illogical answers as well. Um, so uh, yes, we regenerated responses and they got different conclusions all the time. And that was interesting to us. Um, uh, it's, it's very hard for our system to produce a response that is to, to me as a lawyer, meaningful actually. Um, uh, if, um, yeah, just one one quick point yeah. on the consistency there. It did seem like, um, you know, obviously there's a, a prompt engineering issue, which you can change the prompt a little bit and certainly get different responses, but also, you know, different models behave differently as well. Some of the the, the models that were fine tuned were particularly, um, interestingly, particularly uh, inconsistent, I felt. Um, the, the more standard like chat GPT, GPT-4, um, those models are much less willing to take a stand on anything. So they're much more sort of vague in their conclusions, which which does result in less glaring inconsistencies. But it's, you know, that's probably just a result of the guardrails that are sort of put on these things to help them not go flying off into offensive and 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 really misguided and hallucinatory places. Right. Another participant in a prior um, workshop talked about how, he wouldn't mind if a uh, AI system wrote the opinion, but he'd want a human to to issue it, that, the, that there should be an, a human behind the decision that actually enforces it, um, you know, whether reads it aloud or, um, or like a, a form of human in the loop, but he didn't care that it was written by a machine. I found that an interesting comment um, it, for me, so much of what makes decisions, whether from the Supreme Court or other courts, legitimate in my mind has to do with the way it's reasoned, what it says to Anjali's point, how it's weighing different stakeholders and interests down the line, et cetera. Um, and so um, the fact that it would be written by not a human, um, that 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 I thought it would, that, that, that would bother me, for example, but it didn't bother him. He just wanted a, a human enforcing it. Um, that's been something else that people were talking about. Uh, maybe we go to the what's next slide now. Um, um, well, actually, if you, yeah, oh. well, before we have that, um, uh, I wanted to just bring, sort of remind the, like bring back the conversation to something Peter said earlier and that we've been kind of talking around, but it's important to point out, which is that these language models are not reasoning right now. Yeah. There's, you know, I was, was predict that, that doesn't mean that, Reasoning won't come in the future. And that's something we want to actually do another quick poll about. But right, right now, these are meant, they're, they're, as many people have said, they're bullshit generators. They're meant to look persuasive. So it's not, it shouldn't be surprising to us that yeah. the decisions are different because they're just learning, you know, learning, not really learning, but they're modeling the text they've been trained on um, to be persuasive, but not necessarily to be accurate. And that's why, you know, hallucinations are referenced often. So um, right. The question of when, when, and whether reasoning will happen is a big question, and it has a lot of implications. Um, so, with that, um, before we, um, before we talk about, you know, just next steps, because we're just at the end of the hour here, we wanted to do one more poll from you guys, and maybe just have a couple um, moments of discussion on the, what the answers are. So, to the next slide, please. Uh, and maybe we'll actually, rather than have you type in the chat, maybe we'll just have folks weigh in just to have a few respondents to this. Um, do you think that a mind or consciousness or morality is needed for just conclusions to legal or ethical questions? But there's some other options we offered are yes, no, in some fields, but not others sometimes and don't know. Um, but maybe we'd love to hear from, uh, from, from one or a couple people. You mean about a human mind? No, not a human mind. Oh, mind. You know, by your understanding of of the term mind or consciousness or morality, not limited to um, one that's contained in the in the brain necessarily. Yeah. Let's see. Allison says in the chat. Allison, I hope you don't mind if I'm just going to read what you wrote on the chat. 
That's okay. I mean, I can also, I can also oh, please, say it. Please, please, um, jump in. I think, I think, I just, I feel like I've said a lot. Um, no, it's great. Uh, the, the production of the idea is different than making it an effective agential power, and a human does that. So like in that decision one, if an AI makes a decision, whatever, that's just words. Once a human reads it and agrees with it, their agency, their responsibility, their, their effective power in this world is then what's used to make that real. So in this particular case, um, making the conclusion is different than being the force behind which the conclusion carries weight. And that's a human thing, that latter thing. Mm. It sounds to me like an analogy often to, also to medical diagnoses, treatment versus the diagnoses. Yeah, that some, some human needs to take responsibility for it. Mm -hmm. Just to follow up, up on that, um, Allison, and then over to Michael, can you, what I wrote in the chat, can you, I agree with you about agency, but can you imagine... Right now, we're as you mentioned earlier, we're getting to a point where it's hard to distinguish whether something had agent had an agent behind it based on the text. But I'm curious if you can imagine a world in which there were an AI that had agency, and if so, do you believe it would be, you know, have the authority to make ethical decisions? I have a hundred percent flat out opinion about this, which means it's absolutely wrong, right? Like I am so fixed on this. On this, I think if we decided right now to give um, Chat GPT agency, it would have it. It's our choice. I give it to you, right? On an analogy that we're the same person, right? It's all inference. So if we as a group decide if ChatGPT has a legal decision, we're going to take it, it happens, ding. But it's never going to convince us. We have to pick it now and forever. Huh. Huh, interesting. So, I mean, well, I want to hear from Michael, but I guess I, I would kind of be curious to push that line of questioning into, can we assign agency to other, other, uh, non-human entities by our choosing. Like what yeah, about- Absolutely. The art the robot, yes. The painting, <laughs> got it. Okay, cool. Michael, over to you, maybe for the last word. Oh, Maybe the last word, I'll be, try to be brief. One, um, Allison and I are both on an upcoming uh, university-wide plenary panel on this, exactly this topic coming up in a couple of weeks. So uh, that's obviously gonna be a lot of fun, which I knew even before we were having this conversation today, because uh, I, I agree almost hundred percent with what Allison just concluded with. I I did want to respond briefly, but in completely to your prompt here, um, which is to say that if you think about the question in terms of whether something that I say or do, or a particular individual says or does as being just, then I think that there's a long tradition of assuming that there is some kind of reflection associated with that. There's some kind of reasoned process that goes into that. Um, there's also, you could, you could scale that up to a kind of a collective level, right? And say, well, there's some kind of deliberative process that some community goes through to arrive at outcomes that are labeled just. But there's a different way to look at that, which is to say that justice is an attribute of a system or an attribute of an institution. And in that instance, I think that the, the, the question doesn't quite hold up in the same way, right? You could have, uh, and people have had lots of judgments uh, and considerations about the justice of, pick your small large scale institution that have nothing to do with like reflective deliberation at the level of the human mind. Um, mm -hmm. so, so again, as with the other one, you're sort of drawing out a lot of sort of explicit or latent uh, ambiguities and like, what is it that we want out of these processes, these systems, whether they're human created and driven or machines or some blends? Right. That's exactly right. What is it that we want? And I think part of this project is act, is trying to figure that out. We have to think hard about that. Um, what is it we want because we're making them? Um, and uh, it's been fascinating to hear your comments. So thank you so much. Um, so here are next steps. Newman, do you want to do that? Uh, I can I can I can hop in real quick. Any 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 and all of us can. We don't know exactly uh, all of the you know we don't have specific next steps, but just to to send you guys off with um you know uh, thoughts about what we might be doing next. We'd obviously love to hear more from any and all of you too. But you know these workshops have proven to be really really fascinating. Um, thank you all for being a part of this one. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is a this project is really more of a sort of umbrella encompassing a process rather than some specific output, um, you know, we'll, we'll be posting things online eventually. Um, you know, we think a lot about artistic outputs. How could these decisions be used artistically? How could people's opinions about the decisions be used artistically um, in different ways? Um, 
certainly some form, you know, different forms of writing, op-eds, papers, et cetera, might come out of it. And, um, you know, we're always happy and, and, and willing to uh, expand the team in different ways um, to those who are interested in, in joining in. We think this is a topic that is not going to just suddenly go away. It's going to probably continue to deepen in, in our society and become more and more important as, as things, as the technology sort of inexorably uh, progresses, I will put in quotes. Um, but yeah, so thank you very much, everybody. Newman, I don't know if you want to wrap up or have any other comments on what's next. Just thanks so much, everybody, for being here. And, you know, apologies on behalf of all of us for for the Zoom hiccup, but so glad that we all were able to like make this transition. Yeah. <laughs> it was like Michael coming by in his other boat as one boat was sitting and be like, everybody hop on simultaneously. And it seems like uh, most of us made it over. So Nobody yeah, got wet. Thanks so we were, oh, well, look, I, it's my job to thank the three of you. Uh, this is spectacularly interesting and provocative and challenging, and it's brilliant how you're combining philosophy and art and law and policy and tech in these really clever and creative ways. I do feel like we were like on that bus in the movie Speed, uh, where they all had to kind of get off before the whole thing blew up, uh, but we pulled it off. And like, these, like the pandemic has taught us one thing, which is to be really nimble and pivot uh, effectively with tech, which we couldn't really do as well before. Um, I also think that your process is the product closing is brilliant. It reminds me uh, of the artist Christo, um, uh, who, uh, for those of you who remember Christo, uh, like he he insisted that all of the melodrama about planning and approvals and so forth, the hostility and opposition to all of his big public projects was part of the art, uh, mm -hmm. right? And I can elaborate on that separately, but I don't want to take more time. We are out of time. Thank you all so much for presenting, for being here, for part of this. This has been as stimulating, if not more stimulating than I had hoped. So again, uh, spectacular, and I really look forward to seeing how your project evolves. So, Thank you. Aditi, we can cut the recording now. Thanks yes. Okay. Thank you, so, Thank much. you so much, everybody. Yeah. Okay.